We stand before the Holy One today, here at the New Year, reviewing the vows, the resolutions we made in the past year, making amends in areas where we missed the mark and living up to our possibilities, and using that sense of feeling that there's a holier version of ourselves that we want to grow into, to dedicate ourselves to new vows to God, to make that happen, new resolutions for the coming year here together. We do so in ritual and in community, knowing that Judaism teaches us that the power to accomplish this does not solely come from us, but comes in partnership with God and in the strength of community. Wouldn't it be nice if the Torah gave us an example of a vow, of a neder, of change, so that we can make sense of what we're doing here, make sense of what's coming up in Kol Nidre, what are these, all, which means all vows, all neders. What are these neders? What are these resolutions? How does it work Jewishly? What is Kol Nidre releasing us from? The Torah, of course, does give us an example in Numbers chapter 6, an example of a neder, and it's one we pay insufficient attention to. Daber el b'nei Yisrael v'amartalehem ish o isha ki yafli lindor neder nazir lehazir ladonai. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, if any man or woman utter a Nazarite vow, they set themselves apart for Adonai, they shall abstain from wine and any other intoxicant. Interestingly, the word Nazir, the one who sets themselves apart, is almost identical to the word Neder, vow, except that it's Dalid, tilts its head upward toward God. The vow to abstain from any consumption of alcohol or other intoxicants includes a process. During the period of the vow, which is up to the person making the vow, it could be a few days, it could be a week, it could be a month, or the rabbis tell us at the most several months. During that time, they cannot associate with their friends from before. They cannot associate with their family from before at all. They are now in the status of Kodesh, holy. And so they belong to God like the priests with whom they now spend time witnessing the ways of service to God. They outwardly show their holy status by not cutting their hair, as in the Samson story, or as I like to call it, the Victor Mature story, but Samson is good too, until the vow is complete, and then you fully shave it off. You may notice the similarities of this ritual to that of the Mitzora, the person who has the health affliction on the outside, and thus is separated from the community, is examined by the priest repeatedly during the separation. The one contact they have is with the priests. The priest spends time with them, and then they go through a ritual of purification on their return, which does involve mikvah and shaving their hair off. It's a profound parallel now to our inner state, to the inner state of the Nazir. We may look just fine on the outside, we may even begin to believe our own appearances to the outside world, and we do. But where are we not what God intends us to be on the inside? The lesson of the vow reaches all of us. If we can do the honest work to get to this point, the introspection of the days of awe, we connect with our higher power, which is exactly what the vow is, because otherwise it's just another empty promise to ourselves or to others. So what a vow is, is just like in court, when you put your, your hand on the Bible and you say, I make an oath to God that what I say is true. If you want to know what your higher power is, what is the difference that you're thinking when you're doing that versus when you're not putting your hand on the Bible and you're not vowing to God? If you know what that difference is inside, you have a good idea of what your higher power is. We see, the, so it's a vow. It's not just another empty promise. And we see the holiness that we're capable of. We separate ourselves from the habits that keep us trapped even if that involves habits connected to family and friends because they're part of our dynamics, whether coincidentally, coincidentally or because of past hurts or codependence or triggers. And one spends time with those who model 
service to others. You may be saying to yourself right now, my God, that sounds like 12-step recovery. And as a rabbi, you can take my word that all things in the world come from the Torah. <laughs> Today, I invite you to see the process of Haidad Holidays through this lens, for it contains the teaching of the how of High Holidays, that we can change with the help of God and community. And today I invite everyone to see how they might apply this pattern to their own lives. In abbreviated form, and I gotta tell you that sometimes that you'll get an email from me that says, don't forget there are four steps of tshuva, that may be what I say later at Tashli, but actually if you, if you Google it, you'll find out that the rabbis have all different steps. So sometimes there's the four steps of tshuva, and sometimes there's the six steps, and sometimes there are the 10 steps. They're all the same steps, it just depends how many you put in one and stretch it out. So here is a miniature version of the 12-step recovery program. Step one, we admit that our lives, or I add some part of our lives, has become unmanageable, where we display the illusion of control. Step two, a power higher than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Step three, make a decision to serve that higher power. Steps four, five, and six, do an inventory of our defects of character. This is the thinking we're doing during the days of all. This is the al -chit. this is the ashamnu. This is the 25 hours intensively on Yom Kippur. Where have I missed the mark? This is being the individual examined by our shepherd during Unatana Tokev. Do we show up when it's our moment, we're all passing by, and it's our moment in front of um, the one before whom we stand, and do we say, I don't know, I think I'm being a pretty cool sheep? <laughs> or do we use our five minutes with the greatest therapist of all time to say, this is the part of me that needs some tikkun, some fixing? Step seven, turn to God to remove our defects of character. Use the practices and the way and the how. Turning to God, which is step seven, is an exact translation of teshuva. It involves lots of human amends and interpersonal work. Skip to step 11. We pray to understand God's will and for the power to carry that out. At teshuva, what is tefillah? Teshuva, tefillah, tzedakah. Remove the severity of the decrees of the pain in our lives. Tefillah, is that not turned to God to remove our defects of character and praying to understand God's will for the power to carry that out? And 12th, this 12th step of 12th step. Become this help to others who need guidance and support in getting back to the path. Is that not tzedakah? practicing gimilut chasadim, acts of loving kindness by being righteous in service. It's using what you learn from being with the priests, that the highest form of human behavior is service. When you are an individual before God, you don't wave your CV, you don't talk about how you've mastered a complex recipe, that's not the potential God wants you to actualize. It's where you're hurting, what you're working on, and where you're serving. And yes, all this sounds suspiciously like the steps of tshuva, doing a reckoning of where our behavior has fallen short, truly feeling bad over the hurt that it's caused others and ourselves and our higher power, working to make amends, and in so doing, letting the feeling of guilt go, making and starting to live the plan for new behavior, tshuva, tefillah, tzedakah. For a long time, Jews were uncomfortable with the 12-step recovery method since it was designed by Christians. It felt to some like a form of idolatry. Rabbi, is it really okay to be doing that? I heard someone's in that, maybe we don't tell the rabbi. But asking whether it's okay to practice a method designed by Christians is the wrong question. The question is whether this is Jewish. One person who saw this years before others was the great rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel Tversky. He was born in 1930 in Milwaukee. He was part of the great Hasidic dynasty of Ukraine in Chernobyl, 
going all the way back to that influential, amazing student of disciple of the Baal Shem Tov, the Mayor Anayim. After serving as a rabbi in Milwaukee, Rabbi Tversky decided to go back to school, graduating Marquette Medical School. He didn't have the $4,000 for tuition. It was paid by the Lebanese American Catholic entertainer, Danny Thomas. When he heard from one of the deans that there was an Orthodox rabbi who didn't have the tuition. He then did his psychiatric training at the University of Pittsburgh. He became the head of psychiatry at St. Francis Hospital there. He had a double life of sorts. He wrote on Judaism and Torah. He composed the melody we use for Okay, wait for some Qatar. He also founded the highly esteemed Gateway Rehabilitation Clinic. He wrote 80 books, many on Jewish topics, but many others on addictive thinking and addictive personality, all of which enhanced the international reputation as an authority on addiction. He discovered in AA meetings the kind of sincere and even selfless fellow feeling that was often absent in synagogues, wrote Andrew Hines in his 1999 profile. He was moved by the example of men and women who would willingly be awakened in the middle of the night to go out and help a fellow alcoholic. He may not have found it in synagogues, but I wouldn't be here if I didn't think we could be a synagogue to make that happen. He saw no contradiction between the 12 steps and his belief in the laws of Torah. According to his granddaughter, the 12 steps may have been created by Christian believers, she said, but it was about spirituality surrendering to a higher power. And that, for my grandfather, was synonymous with Judaism. He was drawn to 12 step because it helped addicts promptly stop drinking and abusing drugs, in contrast to long-term therapy, which he would also use. But he wanted to get away from the idea that before we can do anything about this, we have to find the cause. He said his more direct approach, the direct approach of lots of therapy with lots of 12-step, was more in accord with the Jewish, um, the Jewish tradition and Alcoholics Anonymous tenets, because it goes directly to the fact that you have the power right now to engage in this process. He died of COVID at Hadassah Hospital in Ain Karim before there was a vaccine. He was one of the losses of the pandemic we have yet to have properly acknowledge, and so I dedicate the sermon to his memory. The profundity of Rabbi Tversky's work and that of other great rabbis like Paul Steinberg, Rami Shapiro, is that it does not pathologize the addict as an other, unlike the rest of us, the non-addict. Find the cause, whether it's psychological, biochemical, genetic, environmental, fix that. It's not that. It rather sees all of us as having addictive behavior, not limited to alcohol and other intoxicants. Addictive behavior stems from suppressing an area of our lives that we feel needs to change, but we consciously or unconsciously feel, and I think more unconsciously, I think our sins, chet, is an unconscious sin. We unconsciously feel that part of our life is out of control. We just simply can't bring reason to it. And so we develop a pattern over one micro, microcosm that we can control. For somehow it's my, how my body will feel if I ingest this. But addictions come in all forms. You can be addicted to food. You can be addicted to sugar. You can be addicted to dieting. You can be addicted to work. You can be addicted to your cell phone, to social media. You can be addicted to Lashon Hara, to negative speech. You can be addicted to avoiding conflict. All of us consciously or unconsciously feel there are parts of our life that are out of control. But this, this little microcosm, I can control. I control how my body will feel in a few moments. I control how my mind will feel. And this provides temporary relief. And so instead of doing the soul work, we close ourselves into these patterns and the process become less emotionally available to ourselves and others. We find ourselves serving the patterns rather than the souls in our lives. Ashamnu, gazalnu, ibarni dofi. We have stolen time from ourselves and from others. We have lied to ourselves and to others. We have deceived ourselves and others, consciously and unconsciously. Think of one part of your life that you feel is out of control and you just can't deal with it. Just do that for a few seconds. 
some part of your life you feel is a little out of control, you just can't deal with it. You just can't say to that person what you need to say. You just can't deal with that. Think of what pattern you have developed to feel okay in the face of it. Think of how that robs you of your best self. In Tversky's book, Addictive Thinking, Understanding Self-Deception, my favorite one, he writes that we cover up our addictive patterns through lies. I would have been home, but I had to stay at work. Did you really have to stay at work? I have to be... I, I, um, I have to keep checking my phone. I might get an email from work, or from a family member, or from something that demands my attention. I only drink one or two drinks a day. This substance helps me do my job better. I will be more emotionally available for my family member if I take this first. And then we believe them ourselves. The point of his book is that addictive thinking is self-deception because you believe what you're saying. And so when you say, Asham nu, sin and I lie, it really is unconscious because you don't think you do. And I think about this all the time. I really do, ever since I read the book years ago. Every high holidays I think, how much do we deceive ourselves? Isn't it true that we all see when others are lying, but we know it's not our place to say anything? When another is saying, I'm totally listening to you, but their eyes are glazed over from their third glass of wine, which they just told you was their second, and it's pretty obvious they probably had at least one before you got there, or they're totally listening to you while they're checking their cell phone. My daughters call me on this all of the time, or answering a work email, but we don't say anything. They do. I've tried to train them not to, by the way. We don't say anything because they've trained us not to because we know they'll be defensive. And we know it's not our place to challenge them when they bring up that their relationship isn't going well or there's some issue in their life that just won't get solved. But we know we're not supposed to point out how much drinking or distraction or lashon hara or avoidance is taking place. I often think, is that what God is? The force in the universe that sees exactly what we're doing and is waiting to be invited to tell you what they see? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not lying. I mean, it's all true, right? And I've trained the people in my life not to tell me, so they're not going to tell me. Is that what God is? The force that's waiting to be invited to tell me? Is that what tefillah, prayer, is? Can we experience the liturgy that way? Show me what you see. What should I be seeing? Is that what the shofar blast is? Wake me up from my slumber. I want to be present. I want to be present for the people, to myself. Help me to gaze squarely at my own reflection to see myself as I am and not as I imagine I am. That's step four of the 12. And once I recognize them, let me make amends with those I've heard as part of my tshuva. And as I do that, let me go of the, let go of the guilt. We are all human, we are all frail, but we have the power to recognize our frailties. And so says the High Holy Day Liturgy. And this requires therapy, but it requires a lot more than therapy. This requires changing addictive thinking to spiritual thinking. Addictive thinking is embedded, has embedded in it, Tversky writes, that I'm broken. That as a human, I'm a lemon. And like cars. And spiritual thinking has embedded that a part of me is broken. And that part can be fixed. Tikkun in Hebrew. And that's what High Holy Days are for. What's my relationship for, with God is for? Tikkun nefesh. I cannot fix myself alone. I need to dig deep and find my higher power, that which connects me to all living beings like myself. And before that power, I offer my choice, my vow to serve, and I do so through serving myself, others, and it. The shofar isn't calling you to go from an A to an A+. Plus. It's trying to get you where your heart is broken and shattered open, and then fasting on Yom Kippur to humble oneself. 
All I need to do in this world is to be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer, in a simple life of service and being a good person. And perhaps this is what the Nazarite learns from spending time with the priests instead of their circle of friends and family. This is what the one in recovery learns from going to meetings. All you have to do is to be honest with yourself and others, listen to others and be a help on their path, the role of the Levites, be a force for healing. As the priest examines the Mitzora, as God examines us through Unatana Tokef, there is no greater love than having someone examine you in your frailty and your vulnerability and return that love. There is nothing more holy and satisfying for all healing happens in community, as 12-step teaches. So this is what we're going to do. First, let us see the part of us that is like the addict at a meeting. They are not part of some special club for recovery from an illness that is not embedded in each of us. They are not fundamentally other. We are one in their flock. Second, let us put aside any stigma that 12-step recovery isn't Jewish enough, or else we better start wondering whether Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are Jewish enough. And I'm really not sure how to write that sermon. Third, especially coming out of a pandemic that has seen a 21% increase in drinking, especially excessive drinking during the pandemic, with a 41% increase in heavy drinking in women, according to the Rand Corporation, let's temper our American glorification of alcohol. As the Buddhist writer Thich Nhat Hanh says, if you, if you abandon your two glasses of wine, it is to show your friends, your children, your society, that your life is not only for yourself, your life is for your ancestors, for future generations, and also your society. To stop drinking two glasses of wine every week is a very deep practice, even if it has not brought you any harm. That is the insight of the Bodhisattva who knows that everything she does is done for all her ancestors and future generations. In modern life, people think that their body belongs to them and that they can do anything they want to it. We also don't teach that in Judaism. This is one of the manifestations of individualism. But according to our teachings, your body is not yours. Your body belongs to your ancestors, your parents, future generations. It also belongs to society and to everything alive. All of them have come together to bring about the presence of this body, the trees, the clouds, everything. Keeping your body healthy is to express gratitude to the whole cosmos, to all ancestors, and not to betray the future generations. Even if we have time, we don't come home to ourselves. We try to keep ourselves constantly entertained, watching television, socializing, or using alcohol or intoxicants because we don't want to experience the suffering inside us ever again. Fourth, in a nation where our drug overdose epidemic continues with over 100,000 overdose deaths in 2021 and where it shows no signs of abating in the face of mental health distress, limited access to addiction support and therapist support and a teetering economy, let's today vow not to pretend that somehow this is not the concern of the Jewish community and of the synagogue. Addiction comes in Jewish forms. We know it, we don't talk about it. It's ourselves, it's our children, it's our grandchildren, it's our parents. From now on, these books, Tversky, Rabbi Mark Borowitz from Beit Shuva, Rabbi Rami Shapiro, Rabbi Paul Steinberg, Rabbi Kari Olitsky, they will all be either right here with our Torah commentaries or close to the commentaries in the hallway. And we wish everyone, you don't have to be in official 12-step, take these books during synagogue and read them during the service, for they too are Torah. We are going to have in the foyer cards from the Jewish Addiction Awareness Network that remind people how to find Jewish and general resources and recommended reading, come from Jewish perspectives, and acknowledge the inclusion of addiction within our community so that we don't end up like I feel a generation did, where you can't tell your Jewish friends in your synagogue, your, your people you meet, 
that your daughter at 24 years old is in need of being in recovery, or they're in recovery and you hope it lasts, or you yourself have been in recovery. And a little later, during the shofar blast at Musaf, I'll share two shofar reflections from people who, come, who have come through 12-step. And finally, fifth. Oh, and in addition, we'll have the periodic serenity Shabbats so that the temple is a place of welcome to the Nazarite. They are not the broken ones. They are spiritual teachers. And finally, fifth, it's time we open up to that teaching within Judaism. Let us practice the four steps, the six steps, the 12 steps of tshuva in our lives. We are not broken, but we have parts that can use fixing. Let's do the holy work as God intended, with honesty, with willingness, and with community. Shana Tovah.